about bread and water. What kind of subject is bread and water? I love my brothers, my Baptist brothers. They have the best subjects. You ever notice that they have the best subject? You know, you know, just, I can't even think of some of them, but they're just uh, some of the greatest subjects. Like, wow. But Don Lavelle uh, is uh, different. So I called it bread and water, and then I added the blessing of bread and water. I thought that would enhance it. <laughs> Let's talk about it because it's very important in our walk with Jesus, bread and water. They are very important. And uh, sometimes we read things and we sometimes read into them things that should not be. And at other times we read out of them things that should not be. You know, so we have to be careful that we we uh, have a proper exegesis of Scripture, that we get out of it God's thoughts, what God has for us. And you can read a Scripture and expound on it for a hundred times, and in the hundred and first time, God will show you something you never saw. It is amazing how it is as we grow in the Lord. And I like growing older, and I'm not decrepit, but I like growing older. And I want to just say momentarily that if you don't have any older friends or or even if you were to say old friends, you need to get one. You need to get a few. Because you can learn so much. You find places where everybody's young. That, that God will bless you, but you are missing out on a lot of wisdom that only the years could give you. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, uh, the, the scripture reads, So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and water. Now notice what he says. So you shall serve the Lord your God. So our responsibility is not to serve the world system, not to serve all of these institutions. Now, now there are, I can break that down a little bit, but for the sake of this message, that is not my first priority, is to serve any human institution. Now, he says, you shall serve the Lord your God. And this is, in my estimation, putting God first, always God first. Not your husband first, not your wife first, God first. Not your children first, God first. And then you will properly understand how to relate to God. And you relate to God through his son, Jesus Christ. If you can't relate to Jesus, you can't relate to the Father. So he's telling us you need to serve the Lord your God. So shall you serve the Lord your God. And what will he do? So he connects you serving, you worshiping him. He will bless your bread and water. You may say... Oh, wow, I want more than bread and water. He, he is using bread, yes, real bread, but he is also, it is speaking of food, that which gives you nourishment. Yes, he did use bread. He rained down manna. He gave them bread and, and to eat, and he gave them water to drink. You may think, well, what about Coca-Cola? You don't know. No, they just had water. And uh, water was a lot better than those, some of the drinks that we drink. And I'm not speaking of Coke, or Diet Coke or stuff yet. Not yet. And he will bless your bread and water. And this, and no, notice what he says. He's not finished there. So that means that God is going to bless your sustenance. But he is not just talking about natural food. Yes, that is included. You, you remember in sixth and seventh grade science when I was a boy, maybe, maybe it's uh, third grade now, but it, and when I was a kid, it was sixth and seventh grade science. They said, you are what you eat. Remember that, anybody? Yeah, yeah, you are what you eat. And so th that is true in the natural. As, as uh, Reverend Stan Mack would say, as it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. Yeah, so as it is in the natural, so is it, it is in the spirit. So then, so then you are what you eat. If you are eating at any table, unhealthy tables, you are what you eat. So you eat some good food, you eat some bad food, and you don't know the difference. That's not good. And so there are believers who are like that. They just like to gorge, you know. And, and so you don't want to do that. This is what he's going to do. He's going to bless your sustenance, what you're taking in. He's going to take that. That's why you always want to, to get a good word. And as a result of you having good word, now, now if you eat healthily, you're going to have health. You are what you eat. Here he says, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. So a lot of times people are sick physically because they don't eat right. All right? So you can also be sick spiritually when you don't eat right. You're eating from any table, every table, and even eating secular stuff, which is poison. 
I know there are brothers and sisters who will try to convince me that, uh, that some secular stuff is good. I don't think at all it's, it, it is at all good. Why? Because it's worldly. And we've taught a little bit about that, that worldliness does not just mean that you go to the bars, you, you go drinking, you go uh, doing smoking and doing drugs and, and, and you're promiscuous. I think you're not married, but you don't, you don't, you don't let that stop you. You know, that, we think, oh, that's secular. But it, only everything that's worldly is secular. That which comes of the world. The Bible says, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if one of, one of us, if we, we love the world, he, he says, this is powerful. It's very graphic and a little bit frightening for me. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He said, you can't have both at the same time. So there are a lot of people who go to church, and they are weak spiritually, totally weak. They have no faith, they have no hope, no joy, no peace. Why? Because they don't eat healthily. They don't eat healthy stuff. Are you still with me? Amen. Amen. And so he promises to take sickness away from the midst of us. So when he promises to take sickness away from, I like that. So you remember in the, in the uh, reading of the scriptures how, the, I believe it was the, um, the was it the, it was, anyway, what, he, what they would do is Jesus suffered outside the gate. So was it the sin offering that they would, would burn it, totally consume, and take the, some of it outside the gate? Was it that one? But anyway, I'll, I'll tell you the offering later. But they would, it, it, it would suffer outside the gate. They would burn it outside the gate. And so it's like when he says, I'm going to take sickness away from the midst of you, he's saying like as a sacrifice, you and I are living sacrifices, but he takes all of that sickness and and all that stuff outside the gate. So it, it's not to be uh, a part of your lifestyle, you living, right? You're, you're living. It's not to be a part of your everyday life. So he takes sickness away from. Jesus suffered outside the gate. It, he did. He suffered outside the gate. They thought, you can't even uh, die as one of us. You're like a, a criminal outside the gate. So those things... Uh, sickness and disease, he doesn't want that to be a part of our lives. Now, natural wear is a part of our lives. You will, your eyes, generally speaking, will grow dim. I see a lot of glasses. And then there are others of you, you've got contacts. So he, he will take that stuff away. Are you with me? So spiritually, he takes also sickness, that is spiritual sickness, away from the midst of us. Amen. Amen. So when he says, I'm going to bless you, what he means is he himself is divine favor, but he is going to also speak divine favor over you. He's going to give you divine favor. That, that is big for me. He, he, is, uh, he is going to look favorably on you. Yeah, he's going, it's like whenever we say we bless you, and I've heard brothers say, oh, that's not a blessing. You've got to say some other words. No, I don't think so. Because biblically, when we say, I bless you, we're invoking divine favor. Amen. I bless you. Divine favor is what we're saying. Divine favor. Amen. Jesus be with you. Jesus be on you. Yeah. You know, so, it, and we also appeal to the authority of that name. Yeah, I bless you in Jesus' name. Authority. Oh, it's powerful. So you and I must understand when the Bible talks to the ancient Israelis that he would bless their bread and water, that is, is speaking also to the believer today. What he is saying is, I'm going to bless your bread and water, and our bread and water are one person, yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. He is our bread and water. So what he's saying is this blessing of Christ is going to be in you and upon you. We have not access that like we ought to okay we have not accessed our true bread and water why because many of us are distracted the lord gave me a word today when i was sitting here that about distraction and uh there are people that god is wooing and calling to be blessed and they are distracted jesus is here and they're yeah, yeah. Can, can I tell you? Uh, I'm going to digress just a moment. I um, sometimes when I'm 
whenever we're traveling or even sometimes here at home, I'll have a word for somebody. And so we're eating lunch or dinner or just sitting in the office, and I'll start to give them a word. And they, literally, they didn't even recognize, oh, the, the tenor of his voice changed. Wow, the direction changed. This is for me. They didn't even recognize it. And somebody will look at them, look. And I said, oh, God, they missed their day, their time. So a lot of times with very immature people, I might say, hey, you need to listen. This is a word from God. Oh, oh, oh. And others, I just said, okay, this has happened too many times. I think God, the Holy Spirit is telling me to back off a bit. Are you still with me on that? Okay, so, so don't be distracted when God is speaking. We have not accessed all that Jesus has for us. God has for us through Jesus. Both are true. We have not accessed it all. And so often we're distracted with the things of this life that we have not fully apprehended Christ. So I want us to do that better, okay? Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. He said, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. When you read this, I like to just break it up into little pieces. When uh, Paul is writing this to the, to the Corinthians, he's writing this to the Corinthians to say, hey, stop presuming on the grace of God. Stop presuming on the grace of God. And, uh, and so what he says here, uh, because they thought, ah, we're fine. We, we've been saved. Hey, we can just do our own thing. And there are, there are denominations that, that pretty much teach that kind of stuff, that you can live a, a, a raggedy life or a semi-raggedy life. Don't worry, because you've been saved, so you've got your get-out-of-hell card. But Paul is warning them. He said, brother, I don't want you to be unaware. Now, now the King James doesn't say unaware. It says ignorant, doesn't it? It says ignorant. Okay, so I was looking at somebody who has a King James. They just looked at me like, I, I, I don't know. It says ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant. I like ignorance in this case. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant. I know ignorant means unaware. It doesn't mean stupid. It means unaware. But I think ignorant kind of drives the, home, the point the home a little stronger. I don't want you to be ignorant. If I said to you, I don't want you to be unaware, you go, okay. But if I say, I don't want you to be ignorant, what are you talking about? So I want to get that one of those moments with you, all right? So I don't want you to be ignorant that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. So what Moses is, is uh, what Paul is saying about Moses and the children of Israel was when they came out of Egypt, there was a huge cloud in the sky that covered them. That's big, isn't it? Can you imagine maybe as many as three million people all covered by one cloud? It's, it's amazing, yeah, like a cloud over Houston, Texas or something. It's just stay there. And, and the cloud would go, and, and they would go, but it was by day a pillar of cloud. Kept them cool during the day. Uh, kept them protected. God was like, I'm, I'm hovering over you. I'm protecting you. I'm blessing you. Well, right now, you and I have that same, same reality. That was natural. We have it spiritually. And, and at night, at night, uh, there was a... A pillar of fire over them. The, the, but it was God was in the pillar of cloud and, and God was in the pillar of fire. Is that amazing? So what the Bible is showing us is that our bread and water, this is still bread and water now. What God is saying, I am your, your sustenance. I'm going to sustain you. I am your protection in the daylight when you can see and in the night when you're sound asleep. I'm still watching over you. That's a reality that you and I must apprehend more deeply than we know. Can we do that? Let's receive this bread and water. Now notice what he says. Uh, all passed through the sea. They all had the same spiritual experience in a sense. All. Now notice how many times he uses all. All. All passed through. All were baptized. Uh, all ate. All drank. You know? So we want you to know that sometimes when we can have a false sense of security. A false sense of security. When I go to church... Really? Is that your security? You go to church? Well, I'm no, they're no better than I am. What are they, holier than thou? They might be. 
Not in a negative sense, but they might be holier than you. You see, what he's saying is, you know, you have to have, you have to eat your own bread. I can't be hungry for you. I have tried in my young ministry to be hungry for people. I, I see what God wants to do, and I'm going, and I'm saying, hey, God, you know, God wants to do this for you. You know, and they just look at you like, what's wrong with you? You know? You know, you can't be hungry for people. But this is what I do know, that if you'll stay around the kitchen where my wife is cooking, you'll get hungry. You said, no, I, I ate before I got here. But you'll eat something else. I, I, we got proof there. You will eat something else. Why? Good food creates appetite. So, so it tells me we must be closing our ears so we can't hear, closing our eyes so we can't see, and stopping up our noses so we can't smell. Because, because good food creates appetite. Now, let me just say, what Paul is saying is that they all ate the same spiritual food, that the manna that rained down from heaven was a, um, a figure of Christ, you know, coming. Uh, but Jesus tells us in John chapter 6 that this manna was not the true bread. See, there was bread and there's true bread. There's preaching and there's true preaching. There's teaching and there's true teaching. And you need to be able to discern it. I am shocked that so many believers cannot discern. You, you know, when you grew up eating good, and I'm speaking naturally now, eating naturally good food. Mama was a great cook, you know, or something like that. Or uh, grandma, you know, you ate good food. Mama was a great cook. Grandma was a great cook. The aunties and uncles were great cooks. And, and then you grow up and you marry somebody who's a great cook, whose mother was a great cook. You know good food. Somebody said, well, it's a matter of taste. Yeah, you have to create some taste buds sometimes, you know, you know, and so you, you begin to know good food. And when you, if you have a trained palate, you can taste something. Mm -mm. You have a trained palate. Some of us don't have a trained palate spiritually nor naturally. And, and so we will just eat at any table. And let me just say that some, I'm going to take a, a few more minutes of your time. But when we were children growing up, and I've told this many times, but for those of you who've never heard it, we had to act like we were saved even if we weren't in the house. Because dad, dad had a, a board of education that he always applied to the seat of learning. And, and so we had to act like we were saved. But I, I look back and I said, we were some bratty little kids. Because if we had church dinners, you know how to bring, everybody brings food. Uh -uh, we were looking for our mother's cooking. Because everybody couldn't cook well. You know, yeah, I know a lot of them could, but, but some of them couldn't. Some of them hadn't learned. And so we were looking for good food. I want you to be so spoiled that you're always looking for good food. You can discern, discern bad food. You can discern when the Word of God is not rightly divided. And you will sh shine away, shy away. Shy away from the, this institutional stuff where people are trying to trap you. Yeah. You know, we all love our country, don't we? I sure hope so. You know, we're kind of quiet on me. But, but I'm going to say your quietness was agreement. You love your nation. I love my nation. But, but nefarious, bad people are using the nation as our bait so that we'll bite. And then they hook us into doing diabolical things, devilish things. So let's be careful that we know... Oh, that doesn't smell like good food to me. I'm not going to eat it. And so they all ate the same, and they all drank from that spiritual rock. Uh, that rock which followed them spiritually was Christ. Paul calls it a spiritual rock. That rock was Christ. And so, so what that means is it doesn't mean that the physical rock itself was Jesus. What it means is that Jesus was supplying that. Jesus, that was a, a picture of Jesus. That, that was... Uh, um, a, 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 not a type, but a, a figure. That was a figure that, okay, this is what Jesus is doing. This rock, Jesus was there. Yahweh was there in the camp with them, supplying their every need, talking to Moses face to face. This is big. This is, can you imagine having God come down and talk to you face to face? That's what he did to Moses. And, and, and he provided uh, water and sustained them through 40 years of traveling in the desert, in the desert where things are dead. This is what he did. And so you find a New Testament. 
you find that men talked with God face to face. Peter, James, John, Matthew talked to God face to face. They had God in the flesh. You and I now have access to God, as it were, spiritually, face to face. Face to face. Bread and water are two things the body needs to sustain vitality. In other words, they're, two, they're, they're sustenance. Without bread, that is nutrition or food, the body would collapse or lose its vitality. It, the, the body would lose its vitality. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be, it would lose its power. It would lose its power to live, to grow, and have physical strength or mental vigor. That's what the body would do. And so you need food. So likewise, in order to continue to grow, you and I need Jesus. We, we don't need to know about generic, oh, God, God, God. Yeah, you can do that. But make sure people know that you're talking about God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So, so, so the, the body would lose it without food. It would have no vigor. And without water, it would lose its ability to function. It would cease to function as it, designed, it is, as it is designed and would go into death. That's what the body would do without bread and water. See, without water, hydration becomes an issue. You know, you, you, you know, if you've ever been dehydrated and you maybe start to faint or feel bad, your, mouth, your throat was sticking, your, your mouth was dry, and you're, you're dehydrated. You see, so without uh, water, hydration becomes an issue because drinking enough water every day is crucial for your, your health. It is crucial for your health to, because it regulates the body temperature. I don't have the time to go into that in detail, but it regulates your body temperature. You know, some of us get too hot too quickly. I'm not talking about physically now. You get too hot, you fly off the handle. Hey, you, you got a nutrition problem, a, spiritually, a spiritual nutrition problem. And then if you're too cold, you just give everybody a cold shoulder, cold, uh, cold hearted. You know, then that, but that, what does that mean? That means that you, you don't have the right nutrition in your body because your body is not properly regulated. And so it also keeps your joints lubricated. The Bible tells us that every joint supplies something in the body of Christ. Every joint supplies something that another person that needs or, or another body part needs. Every joint supplies. You may say, well, I'm not supplying anything. No, if you're in the body, you're supplying something. You may not be supplying it as well as you could because you're not spiritually nourished because you refuse the food God's giving you. Okay? So, so it, it, too hot, too cold. Then, of course, uh, not lubricated. So you've got to keep your joints lubricated. Uh, it also prevents infection. Proper nutrition prevents infection. So you can have disease come into the a body, a church body. Some body, church bodies are just destroyed because they allow disease to come in. Because we've not had enough of the Word of God and, and the Spirit of God. And then it, it will also, uh, good new hydration or good water and food will also deliver nutrients to the cell, to your body cell. So that means everybody is going to be better because you are allowing uh, God to minister to you through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Then it removes waste. That is, because when you've got people eating, there will going to be some waste. And so when, when you're eating, there's going to be some waste. And so the waste passing is a wonderful thing. But we get all flabbergasted in the church when waste is passed. We go, oh, what is that? What is that? What's that attitude? No, waste is passed. And so it, it removes waste. And it keeps organs functioning properly. It gets the toxins out of the body. Amen. Are you with me? It gets them, it removes them. So that's what waste is. When you see the waste, you go, the toxins are getting out of here. And so that's what we want. Why? Because of eating bread and water and receiving Jesus Christ. Your body must have water to survive. And that's what God is saying to us, that we and you and I must have Jesus and the Spirit of God to survive this world, the onslaught of this world. The world is, it, my dad said, the devil, he told me one day, I was crying about something one day. I mean, I don't know what y'all think I was a Pillsbury doughboy. It wasn't. But I was the kind of guy who, who could shed a tear. And, uh, but you, a lot of times I shed the tears because I was ready to do something. 
I won't tell you all what that was. And I was really bothered by something. This was sort of a different time. I'd been really hurt by some, uh, some people in, in my life. I'd really been hurt. I didn't know what to do because I loved them and cared for them. And my dad said, son, if the devil hasn't touched something good, he hasn't done anything. He said, you see, son, the devil is always after something good. So if you see that somebody got tipped up by the devil, that was a good person that the devil tried to work his wiles to trip them up. Wow. So I understood that then the devil's job is to hurt and destroy all of us. But we can avoid that by feasting on Jesus, by having the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, when Jesus comes into your heart, then the Holy Spirit brings, uh, as it were, the Holy Spirit comes in your life. Then Jesus, as it were, comes into your life totally. He comes into your life and that argues for the divinity of Jesus. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, that means Jesus is there. Because Jesus is there, and I'm going to say he, he lives in you by his Spirit. He lives in you by his Spirit. Jesus is bodily on the throne of God. But he lives in you by his spirit. And so when the, he said, I've got the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, whichever you want to say. I've got the Holy Ghost. Then that means Jesus is there. And and if since Jesus is there, it argues for his divinity because he could not be there if he were not divine, if he were not part of the Trinity, if he was not the God, part of the Godhead. So then you have now what? With Jesus, the Holy Spirit, bread and water, and you have the God the Father who authored it all. Wow, that's big, isn't it? Let me... <laughs> okay, I want you to know that the, the praise team is behind me. And they are doing right. I was the one who was going over. I was moving a little slowly in my explanations. And I wanted you to get all of them before I stopped. So let me just finish some up by saying this. When God promised to bless Israel's bread and water, he linked or he tied it to a promise. He said, saying, I will take a, a sickness away from the midst of you. He meant that he was going to give Israel spiritual health. And Jesus is spiritually now our bread and water. And he has promised to take spiritual sickness away from the midst of us. And so often he takes physical sickness away from the midst of us. But totally spiritual sickness he takes uh, uh, it away from the midst of us so that we are, we're not always walking and thinking in sin and so we're going to uh, just ask God to give us a better understanding of this Jesus is the reason of the cause for our spirituality without Jesus the bread we would not be spiritual people and so Jesus has given us his spirit and now we have both bread and water because the spirit is water to our souls he is water to our souls. And so Christ now resides in us, leading and guiding us through the Holy Spirit. I, I, I would that I had time to share more of this, um, but I don't today. So I will do it either Wednesday or, or next Sunday, um, preferably next Sunday, but I want you to come Wednesday anyway. And, and let's share some more of this word. Are you with me? All right. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I'll be right back in a moment.